ones. Again, happy Father's Day to our fathers in the room. Um, it, it doesn't really take uh, a day, uh, especially for believers, to celebrate mothers and fathers, but specifically on Father's Day, it's a reminder of brokenness in the world for me um, and a lot of people uh, where I'm from because it's a day where people highlight the fact that they lack one. Uh, Talani was in the grocery store and <laughs> the checkout counter and the cashier told her Happy Father's Day. I don't know what that means, but um, and it's kind of something that uh, people have owned in certain aspects of black American culture and it's very heartbreaking. Uh, so, happy Father's Day, men. Because you are a divinely called piece in a puzzle of a healthy society. Necessary. And I hope you're honored by that and you honor the Lord with that. Um, I want to do, say a reminder. I hope you've gotten uh, information about this. But starting next week, we're doing one service throughout the summer. Uh, I think it's through August 26th or maybe up there. Oh, yeah. Is that 26th or 28th? Ah, okay, August 28th. Um, uh, through the summer, one service at 10 a.m. For more information on that, you can see the weekly or the uh, info doc. or What's happening? There he is. Thank you, Darren. Uh, also, on July 24th, uh, church picnic. So... Please put that in your calendar. We want to tell you now so that you know July 24th, church picnic. It's very simple. If you've already planned a vacation that time, just cancel it. <laughs> it's going to be at Grace Community Church. Uh, it's going to be at 5 p.m. so your kids can get the naps in. Um, also joking about the vacation thing. Hopefully you're free. If you're free, come bring the family. It's going to be great food. We're going to make Bobby cook everything. And there's going to be fun sports. I went to Grace. I think you guys did a picnic there a year ago or sometime. It's an incredible place outside. So it's going to be fun. It's a lot of activity to do a lot of fun stuff. Scavenger hunts, sports, non-sports, just chilling and eating. A lot of things. So hopefully you're able to come. We are still uh, and still in the beginning of our series, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Um, and it's a, it's a father's story. Um, that wasn't planned, and that's also not really what's highlighted. I just, it's a sermon, so I had to connect it. Um, <laughs> but it is a father's story, Abraham, and uh, I think we are pretty familiar with this father's story. I don't want to assume everyone is, but if you grew up in church or you grew up around church culture, you might be familiar with this, with this story. Um, but I want to start the way I, sa I said I would start some sermons for you. God is good and all the time. Okay. I want us to remember that. Remember that refrain. Because when we think about the mark of a successful life, you have a successful life. What does it mean to have a successful life? Um, I'm not assuming that everybody's definition might be having a lot of wealth or at least comfortable amount of money, a big family, or at least a loving family you like being around. Or maybe whatever that is, <laughs> a permanent vacation life, <laughs> or living a good life and at the end of it retiring and vacationing and enjoying the beauty of God's creation, things like that. You have this successful life. We have these pictures in our minds about what a successful life is. And, and then we're given the tools or people expect to be given the tools to be able to attain these things. And then life interrupts it. These things that happen that seems like an interruption to this pursuit of having a successful life. Tragedy and trial. Things go on. I think about when it comes to, I guess, Christians or for lack of a better phrase, Christian culture. Uh, that interruption of a successful life or peace and harmony and happiness has led to this kind of popular thing today called deconstruction. You might think that's not related, but people have endured pains and hurts 
And because of those things that they've endured in their life, they've made conclusions about God. Because this pursuit of what's supposed to be successful or successful living has been interrupted. And uh, maybe they even come up with wrong views of God. Or maybe through these interruptions that may be called tragedies or trials, there's some purification and some sanctification that happens as a result of it. And people come out on the other side worshiping God. And so how do you end up with all those different possibilities? When you think about trials in a Christian life, I think a better word is tests. Sometimes it's translated in scripture as temptation, but we'll get to that. Trials, they can be distinguished from tests in that uh, there's a good God who is willing and able to comfort us and bring us peace when tragedy strikes. And a trial is a necessary time where we cling to that comfort and receive his comfort in that time. It may be a result of just broken world and evil in the world. But tests, we have a good God who's willing to cut away the dead parts of us that we would resemble him more and more. You're a little different. And so Genesis 22, this father's story is a story about tests, testing. It's familiar. Uh, It's heart-wrenching. But it's significant for the edification of the church. Oops, sorry. How do I go back? Um, I want us to understand that uh, when it comes to the Christian life and, and Christian living, God will test those he loves. That's the main statement I want you to leave with. He tests those he loves. Well, why? Because he wants to give you an opportunity to show your undying love for him. It's not uncommon. It's not rare. It's actually layered throughout the entire scriptures of the way he deals with his children. And we can engage these tests freely because our adoption as sons and daughters of this God has been granted to us, not through our ability to take tests well, but through one who did take the perfect test perfectly. So I want us to engage that. As we glean this passage together in Genesis 22, I want us to consider our own hearts in relation to our profession of faith and our fear of the Lord, and then the promise that comes through Christ, this promise of hope. So let's look at this overview of the passage. Um, It's a story of foreshadowing. Now, typically, if Genesis 22 is being preached, this is the last slide. It's like, hey, all this foreshadowing, you know, Abraham and his son, and uh, God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his son. You got sacrifice in there. You got... Uh, imagery throughout the narrative you have Isaac who carries the wood to his own sacrifice he's silent as he's about to be sacrificed he asked that one question which I thought was a pretty logical question it's like dad we're about to do a sacrifice and where's the lamb but other than that we don't hear anything from him he's the beloved son of the father sometimes the translation says only son it's because we know Abraham had more than one son But Isaac is the only one in the house. He's the beloved son of the father. Sacrifice takes place on the mountain. The conversation between Abraham and Isaac gives some foreshadowing. After he asks, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, well, God will provide the sacrifice. But now we know what that points to, that he did provide the sacrifice. 2,000 years later, Jesus lives that sacrifice for every single one of us. He 
But then 2,000 years later after that, I think we've, in culture, become so familiarized with the story that we more so highlight what we don't like about it. This is a gut-wrenching story. I've had many conversations on this passage where we aren't talking about what we learn from it and what we learn about God and what we learn about his character, what we learn about us. The, the conversation is always layered with questions that start with, well, how could, typically finished by a good God, even tell someone to do this? I want nothing to do with this God. Or how could a good God tell someone to do something like this? I think that our interpretation of the way this is going probably should change. Or how could a good God tell someone to do something like this? I want nothing to do with this God or anybody who'd obey him. God's faithfulness is shown through his revelation of scripture and that we have the scriptures and we can see in this passage and then read it and then we can flip over to the right side of the Bible and see, ah, this is what it's pointing to ultimately. And it's true. But there were people who were also written this passage. There were people who this passage was written to. And how did they read this passage? Because it's beneficial to us to recognize it as well. The people who were reading this passage understood the, uh, the purpose of tests. And God's children will always be tested. The magnitudes will be different. The circumstances will be different. But the purpose remains the same. That we would be conformed to the image of our king more and more and more. And that he would be glorified through our lives. Now, our understanding of tests is, is a bit different. Uh, we think about tests, and I think about school. Some of you probably just got triggered because you just finished a bunch of exams, maybe. And the anxiety is still fresh. But uh, we ought to think of testing in this biblical context as an opportunity to prove oneself. Or a trial. Or a purification of a metal or a fine jewelry of something like that. I think about Daniel. In Daniel 1, uh, Daniel and his comrades were told to eat the king's food. And they were like, no, we don't want to. We're going to fast because that's our loyalty to Yahweh. As a matter of fact, you can test us on this. He says, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. It's, it's not really a test of like, hey, I'm going to ask you a question. Or I'm, I'm going to give you a task to do and, and see if you do it well or the quality of your work. You told me who you are. Now show me if that's true. It's the way God tells, talks with, uh, deals with his children. It's the way Daniel is dealing with it here. Genesis 22 is about testing. There's more biblical themes on testing. Job is probably the most uncomfortable, but it's about testing. Do you love God for who he is, or do you love him because of the stuff he can do for you? Solomon's put on trial by a queen about his wisdom. You say you are wise. Prove it to be true. Moses is tested to show his love for his kinsmen and his knowledge of Yahweh's loving forgiveness. And there are many scenarios of Israel being tested. But the very first test comes in the same book we're reading from right now in Genesis 1. Genesis 3, actually. Where Yahweh puts this tree in the garden. God, before that, he creates man. Man is made to know, love, and serve God. Man is then given the opportunity to show they have a desire for such a relationship. 
And because of the way they responded to that test, we've been trusting our own understanding and wisdom ever since. Holding on to these things called good and bad or evil and deciding what's good, what's bad. Twisting and turning definitions and because our wisdom is good in our own eyes as humans. It's very interesting what Paul says, though, in Romans 12, too. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God's word says it is what it says it is. Test it. Prove it to be true. The more degrees we get and the more learning we do in our society, then the more archaic his word can seem. It's like, I mean, I get it in the traditions, and, and there are some good moral principles, you know, things like that, but, um, but it's old. We're way smarter today. I mean, come on. We know so much more today. And I think that it would do us better to recognize that uh, that's not what wisdom is. I may have lost myself here. Oh, okay, we're good. But we think about uh, the, the wisdom and knowledge that we have, and then we completely disregard those who wrote the scriptures and the information that they've been granted to point to their immediate audience, but then to us about what it means to live a life of godliness. What all this means, what does it mean to be a child of God? And we can either inadvertently or purposely cast away what they have to say about who God is and what it means to follow him. And so now our conversations about this test in Genesis 3, just like the ones in Genesis 22, why would God even put a tree in the garden if he knew they were going to sin? Why would he put a tree in the garden that they can't eat from? Just doesn't make sense, God. Answer to the logic. The answer is actually pretty simple. Love can only exist if there's free will to love, the true volitional love. If humans can make robots, surely God could have made robots. That's not love, though. That's programming. Love only exists if there's free will to love. It can only exist if there's a beloved. And the tree was an opportunity to give that love. The tree was an opportunity to say, do you trust my wisdom? Do you trust my instruction? Do you trust my guidance? Or would you like to wield your own? And be enslaved to it. Obviously we know what the choice is. And in God's grace. Humans die as a result. Why is that grace? Because. We're broken. And then we could potentially live forever as broken people. But we die. And now he's given us a chance to be reborn. What good news. Abraham was given an opportunity to show his love, trust, and honor of God. Verse 12. Then he said, this is right before Abraham sacrifices Isaac. Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. You know, something that was always boggling to me is that when people read this passage and they say, man, I have, I have a problem with this. Why would God do that? It's like, what did he do? Like, no, one, no one died. <laughs> did, you read, did you read the whole passage? The entire passage starts with after these things, God tested Abraham. He tested him. It's like, you don't like tests? That's legit. I mean, you don't take tests. But this is what he says. That now I know 
that you fear God. There were opportunities where Abraham had tests earlier. Fear of God wasn't so much. The concept of the fear of God, I think, is a beautiful concept. When we think about reverence, trust, love, kind of merging all together. There's this understanding about God where when we understand his love, then his authority has to diminish or I kind of like the, the scariness of him. You know, he's an omnipotent, omni, omnipresent being who created everything and by him all things exist. There's that C.S. Lewis quote where the little girl is asking about the lion, the God representative in Chronicles of Narnia and saying, is, is the lion safe? And it's like, safe? No. But he's good. He's good. And I know it's a hard concept to grasp, but we understand it in other realms. The sun itself, we know to be a good thing. We enjoy it when it's out there. But we know it's dangerous. If Elon comes up next month, say, hey, we're going to the sun. Who's down? (laughs) Nobody. It's dangerous up there. A solar eclipse, I remember, whenever it happens, you know, people, the blogs start flowing about, hey, look, it's a solar eclipse, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, but here's what you should not do. He's laughing at the fact that Donald Trump immediately looked up at the sun and he was the president. It's pretty stupid. They come up with all these lists and instructions on how to engage the sun. Don't be careless. Take proper precautions when you engage looking at the solar eclipse because it's dangerous. And then society says, but when it comes to the one who made it, do what you will. That's the whole point of the way God reveals himself to Israel. Look, you need to build this thing. You need to cleanse yourself in a certain way. You need to go through these steps because I'm dangerous. You can't be near me, common people. But I am going to go through the greatest lengths that that won't be true anymore. So Abraham, he had seen what this dangerous God had done before. Abraham was there when Sodom and Gomorrah met Yahweh. But he had also seen the power of God's love. And so he trusted him. And when he gave the opportunity, when he was given the opportunity to obey in believing loyalty, he did it. Even when it came to God's instruction to sacrifice his own son because he knew God is good. All the time, every circumstance, he's good. But Abraham, I don't, I don't know if that's the quite inter- correct interpretation. You know, he says, go sacrifice your son. Let's break down that word sacrifice. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's something else. And like, no, 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 no. This is what he said, and I trust him. He's good. Man, that's hard. It's genuinely hard. And we can look and read the narrative and see that God provided the sacrifice. But then also what he did is he provided us the strength to take tests. And he provided us the status as perfect test takers. There's always this thing that we need to reconcile when it comes to the language of Scripture. Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord tests the righteous. It's like, now, you can be a human being and, and 
own that and say, yeah, that's right. He tests us. You know, we're right. I'm, I'm a righteous person. And theologically, that's true, but there is a struggle we feel when it, whenever someone calls you righteous. I think that's the beautiful humility of the Christian life and that there is no boasting because you know you didn't do anything to earn it anyway. But how do I deal with the fact that it says this on the left side of the Bible in the Old Testament? In a time where the prophet says there is no one who is good, no one who is righteous. How do we reconcile the psalmist in Psalm 24 that says, hey, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who, who can stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hasn't lifted up his soul to what is false and sworn deceitfully. Who's that person? How do we reconcile it? Abraham says in Genesis 22, 8, when his son asks a very reasonable question, God himself will provide. He provides the sacrifice. And he provides the righteousness that comes from perfect test takers. He provides it through Jesus Christ. See, Abraham's not our model. That's what the good, bad, and ugly series is. It's to show that these historical people who did good things and modeled good things, did bad things, and some that are just ugly, and then some who are just kind of a mix of them all, really. But there's no one who is actually good. Abraham's not our model. This isn't Abraham's first test. This is the same Abraham that after God told him, I'm going to give you a promised seed, his wife said, hey, look, we haven't had the promised seed yet. Go take Hagar. Because I think that's the way we can fix this. We, we have this bad scenario, and now that we can wield what's good and bad on our own, go ahead and take her, and let's get a son out of it. Then she ends up hating Hagar, Sarah does, and Abraham's response, yeah, I mean, she's yours, do what you want with her. So Abraham is not the model. He comes across other people and he tells them that his wife is his sister because he's afraid that he'll be killed and he doesn't have Yahweh's protection. He's not our model. But we have a lot in common with him, though. Meanwhile, Jesus humbled himself as a servant to the point of death on a cross. Silent. If this passage is about testing, let's look at what Jesus is saying about testing. Because he says some stuff about testing. I mentioned earlier that this translation... Uh, of temptation, it's not far off, but I don't think it's good. I don't think it's great. Because this idea of testing is an idea of God purifying you in the hardest of ways. We've read the story. We see it. And we know that it's good. We know that it's good. We can persevere in those moments, in those dark times, and say, Lord, I know this is good. But here's the beautiful thing that Jesus modeled for us. You can ask him not to do it. That's what the Lord's prayer is. It's an exaltation of who God is and a, and a purification of your own heart. It's not mixed with any other motivations and saying, Lord, your will, not mine at all. Forgive us our debts while we forgive our, our debtors. And lead us not into the test. And the implication is, if you do, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus repeats this sentiment in Matthew 26 in his Garden of Gethsemane, modeling for us the freedom we have as children, but then the motivations we're to have in our hearts. He knows he's the Savior of the world, yet he still asks for the cup to pass. Lord, would you keep me from this test? but not my will, yours. There's a freedom that comes when you know that God is good all the time. You can ask of him anything, 
And you're free to ask it when you're not afraid of the certain answer that you don't want to hear. Because you know no matter what, the answer he gives is good. It's a good one. You have a proper fear of the Lord, and you have proper knowledge of his goodness, and you have freedom in your prayer. You have peace in your heart. Lord, keep me from this test. When you have fear of the Lord and you have knowledge of his goodness, then you can trust everything from him. You can trust everything from him. Not my will, but yours. The perfect test taker in Christ provides us the righteousness to be called perfect. His test of going to that cross is the perfect test handled perfectly. And so we gain the righteousness through his test taking, but we also gain the wisdom and the strength to endure tests we never thought we'd be able to endure. I want the church to know that the trials in our lives, every single one serves as an opportunity to glorify the Lord. And I want you to hear me clearly. That does not mean, I know that people can greet you in trials and testing and say, hey, buck up. Or hey, things will get better as if you're not meant to mourn or be sad or sorrowful. No, that's a part of the journey. God is near to the brokenhearted. Have a broken heart. Don't miss out on what it means to be comforted by him. But know it's an opportunity to glorify him. Don't let it rob your joy. The greatest good in this world is not our safety and comfort and never have, enduring any trials. No. The greatest good is having a relationship with the one, the source of safety and comfort. And that relationship grows closer through trial. Where have your thoughts been when it comes to testing When it comes to God's goodness all the time and all the time him being good. I have time for this one last story. Just like Abraham, just like Job, just like many others. I want us to think about what we find good about God. Is it him? Or is it the things that we want him to do for us? If true goodness comes from him alone and we are walking down a path that's chasing after the stuff, then it's only good for him to get our attention. It's only good. There's a story that I heard. Um, and I forget where it was. I, I want to say K Kansas or Kentucky. Um, but I can't remember. Uh, and there was a pastor um, who was about to preach, and he invited a guest minister up. It was a childhood friend. And he invited the guest minister up, and the guest minister told this story. He said a father and his son and a friend of his son were sailing off the Pacific, Pacific coast when a fast storm blocked any attempt to get back to the shore. The waves were so high that even though the father was an experienced sailor, he could not keep the boat upright, and the three were swept into the ocean as the boat capsized. The old man hesitated for a moment as he was telling the story. He was an old man, and he made eye contact with like two teenagers in, in his hesitation, so he, ju he jumped, jumped right back in because they were locked in. Grabbing a rescue line, he continued, the father had to make the most excruciating decision to which boy does he throw the end of the rope? His son or the son's friend? 
The father knew that his son was a Christian, and he also knew that his son's friend was not. The agony of his decision could not be matched by the torrent of waves. And as the father yelled out, son, I love you, he tossed the line to his friend. And by the time the father had pulled the friend back to the capsized boat, his son had disappeared beneath the raging swells into the black night, and his body was never discovered. And by this time, the two teenagers are sitting upright. They're, they're genuinely engaged. And the father, as the minister continued, he knew his son would step into eternity with Jesus. What faith. And he could not bear the thought of his son's friend stepping into an eternity without Jesus. Therefore, he sacrificed his son to save the son's friend. How great is the love of God that he should do the same for us, the minister said. Our heavenly father sacrificed his only begotten son so that we could be saved. I urge you to accept his offer to rescue you. And take hold of the lifeline he is throwing out to you in this service. And so he steps down and the pastor gets up and preaches. And right after the sermon, the two teenagers uh, make a beeline for the minister. And they're like, man, that was a profound story. Thank you. Um, And it's just even like the skeptic, skeptical teenagers, like, you know, typically when people do that with the gospel, a story synonymous to, to prove the point. It doesn't really hit us well, but that one definitely hit us. And the old man was like, well, I'm glad. It is quite an unbelievable story when you think about it. But God's love is unbelievable too, yet it's true. And the old man told the teenagers, he said, but God sometimes with his children gives them a gift to be able to get a glimpse of his love for us. And he's given me that gift because I'm that father. That boy was my son. His friend is your pastor. And I think about a story like that. And I'm immediately overcome with beauty, awe, and terrifying fear. Because the test... is one that we ought to ask the Lord to keep us from. But it's also one that we can trust his goodness in. I can't imagine making that decision. But what we can have solace in is that that decision has been made already for us. And through the perfect test, we are granted strength that we would never even imagine we'd have to endure tests that may may find us. Let me pray as we prepare for communion. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into the test. But if you do, deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Some of you may be going through testing of some sort, different magnitudes, trials of some sort, of different magnitudes. I want you in communion to spend time gathering together. Fathers, if your families are here, gather with them. Brothers and sisters, gather together and 
take a couple of seconds or a minute or two and share that you're in a test or a trial. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. And take communion together. Being reminded that for those who are in Christ, the test is not what grants you the righteousness. The righteousness has been granted already through the perfect test. The test conforms you to more and more fit the mold of one who is righteous. And the Lord is good to not test his children beyond what they can bear. If you do not know the Lord, then your test might just be temptation, actually. And you can know him. And you can trust in his test taking, the fact that he lived, died, and rose again from the dead in victory. That your temptations become victorious moments. And at any point when you fail in temptation, your status as perfect and righteous remains unblemished because of this perfect test taker. So let no one sit alone as we take communion today. Let's pray together and remember the perfect test 